Hello and welcome to the recording of this event hosted by the IET Surrey called Capturing the Action and it's the story of how technology is used to optimise the performance of our Olympic athletes. Our guest in this video is Dr Simon Goodwill who is the head of the Centre for Sports Engineering at Sheffield Hallam University. He leads a team of scientists and engineers and his main research area is the application of novel photography techniques coupled with optimising software applications uh, which link data acquisition hardware and the camera systems. So starting from modelling the impact of a tennis ball and a racket for the International Tennis Federation, he's applied image capture analysis to a wide range of sports to help monitor elite athletes training and tournament performances, um, including all 26 of the Summer Olympic sports. And playing a major role in the development of the Advanced Wellbeing Research Centre at Sheffield Hallam, Simon's current work involves tools that monitor the and uh, enhance indeed the performance of elite athletes by studying both sleep and physical activity to answer health related research questions. So uh, shortly you'll see the presentation by Simon who explains the techniques that uh, they use at the Centre for Sports Engineering Research and later on you'll find the questions and answers uh, including those put forward by the audience at the live recording. And uh, we, we delved into all sorts of things in the questions and answers sessions, the difference between men and women, the difference between able-bodied and Paralympic sports, uh, how it's possible to not only measure the performance of an athlete but how to then communicate it in order that the athlete can modify his or her performance and improve and um, during the talk Simon talked about the uh, very uh, renowned swimmer um, Adam Peaty who uh, has won uh, four gold medals in the championships for four consecutive uh, attempts. So this performance enhancing technology uh, I think we can say really does work. We also delved into which sport was uh, Simon's personal favourite and uh, an interesting anecdote that you'll find right at the end of this video. But I started by asking Simon about the Tokyo 2020 Olympics which was just round the corner when we recorded this video and uh, one, of the, um, one of the aspects of that was why was it still called the 2020 Olympics even though we're now in 2021. Not sure. Um, Covid has brought unprecedented times. That phrase has been there. Uh, I've not heard of that phrase before till about uh, February last year. And then with the, the obvious right decision last year to cancel, uh, so should I say postpone the Olympics, uh, should have happened last summer. Um, keeping the brand in, so it's still Tokyo 2020. And um, I'm ever the optimist, so I fully, fully expect the Games will be starting, as you say, in, in July. Um, although I'm sure there'll be a few challenges, but I'm sure we'll, we'll meet those challenges, as will the other nations. And it is worth pointing out that there are many championships happening all over the world um, right now, um, intercontinental championships, European championships, so yeah. Lots, Lots of things that have happened behind closed doors, which... The crowd certainly don't. The, the athletes don't get the same boost from the crowd when they're they're doing something fantastic. But um... that's right. That's right. I'm sure it'll be a different Olympics. I think we all have to be realistic. It won't be quite the same. Um, no international spectators. Um, lots of there are lots of challenges just getting the athletes there. I'm sure you've seen some people have seen it publicised. Uh, Japan has again quite rightly put certain restrictions on incoming flights, which has posed challenges, but. Yeah, we'll get hopefully if it all if it all happens, we'll get our athletes there, and uh, and it'll be a fantastic games, um, albeit slightly different. And, and when they when uh, it was um, it became clear to me that it's it's still called the twenty twenty. I, I, I thought we were being shortchanged. But, um, then somebody pointed out, well, all the uh, the marketing and the branding and all the collateral is already been printed and manufactured so just throwing it away and, and changing one digit didn't, really doesn't make sense. It, that's right that's right it happens every four years so they're keeping sync 
um, the really Paris Paris Games in 2024. Mm. So everything's everything's kept nicely in sync, and uh, yeah, all all the right decisions have been made. So then, Simon, tell us all about um, elite sports and capturing the the world of uh, performance related to that. I'll, I'll leave the stage now and we'll come back for some questions and answers a little bit later on, if that's OK. Absolutely. Absolutely. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction, Nigel. And also thank you for inviting me along. I'm going to uh, hopefully share my screen now. So we'll go there. Um, so I'm going to make the assumption, unless anybody tells me otherwise, that that's my screen successfully shared. Um, as with uh, everyone working at home, I'm just apologising in advance if we get joined by one of my uh, three children. The three-year-old, I've told, uh, not to come in, but um, whether she'll listen, I'm not so sure. Um, so Nigel's already covered the title, the presentation this evening, and, um, and this is a fantastic new building, the Advanced Wellbeing Research Centre. Uh, which I'll speak a little bit more about um, in one of the following slides. But my starting slide, and specifically the image here, I often show is it really encapsulates the kind of work we do uh, in the Sports Engineering Research Group at Sheffield Harm University. So just to talk us through it, we've got a cyclist, it's actually one of my colleagues on a bike, and then we've got a 3D depth camera. So it's actually a piece of consumer hardware used on a Microsoft um, Xbox 3D camera. And what we're using here, we're basically creating a virtual wind tunnel. So wind tunnels, very expensive, just getting time in a wind tunnel is very expensive. But what we can do here, this is admittedly jumping uh, straight in with an example, we've created a bespoke piece of software that interfaces to the camera using a software development kit provided by, the, uh, provided by Microsoft. And what we can look at is, as the cyclist changes their body shape um, on the bike, we can give a real-time feedback on the frontal area of the cyclist. And from that, you can make conclusions around the, um, the drag, the overall drag force on the cyclist. So like I say, that's, that's kind of a, uh, an intro image of the kind of work we do. Um, just a little bit about our research centre. Um, we consider ourselves the largest academic uh, research centre for sports engineering in the world. We've got about 18 research staff, 23 PhD students and 22 master's students, so a big postgraduate um, research community. We're involved in all areas, so research, consultancy, education. Um, in our work, we've got long, really long-standing partnerships with both commercial and non-commercial sports industry. So, for example, myself did my PhD back in, uh, in the mid-90s with the International Tennis Federation, a governing body of tennis, and still work very closely with them, as I do with other governing bodies. Um, and one last thing that I was dropping, um, some of you may know Steve Haig is certainly presented at uh, these events before. He really founded the whole field of um, sports engineering back in the mid-90s, and uh, I was proudly say I was alongside him when we when uh, he was uh, found in this field of, uh, of research. So again, just uh, start off by showing the team uh, up here in Sheffield Harm University. The reason for showing this slide is just to emphasize that the team cover a number of uh, areas, a number of backgrounds, mechanical engineering, mathematics, electronics, software and developers, um, as, I, as I show here. Um, Really, one key element and one key message that I'll uh, keep uh, bringing, bringing us back to in this presentation is how we fundamentally are applying engineering principles to improve sport performance. So whichever project we may be working on, that is the, that is the common thread. Um, and then I showed a picture of the building. I just want this very, very short sequence of slides just shows where we are. We're in this building here, the Advanced Wellbeing Research Centre. This whole site is built on the old uh, Don Valley Athletic Stadium site, which was knocked down uh, a number of years ago now in Sheffield, on the west part of Sheffield. Um, in our building, we've got multiple research groups, one of which is the National Centre, Spot and Exercise Medicine, specifically the research hub for that, um, for that centre. And then quickly shooting around the, uh, the site, we've got a couple of schools, Academy and the University Technical College. 
Really importantly, we're co-located with the English Institute of Sport, which for those of you who don't know are the centres, is a number of EIS buildings all over the country, which house all our elite athletes, our Olympic athletes or Team GB. So it's a fantastic facility for us to be co-located right next door to the athletes that we're working with. Um, and then a couple of uh, new buildings that are coming up. So we've got the Legacy Stadium, the Centre for Child Health Technology, and also the new Canon Medical Research Hub, which will contain uh, medical imaging facilities, which I'm sure we'll look at how they can complement uh, our existing research. But anyway, back to, back to the topic, medals. Being really frank, it's all about winning Olympic medals. The aim, the vision, the motivation for much of our work in this area is to win Olympic medals. And a slightly tongue in cheek start uh, to the presentation with a, with a couple of slides. Um, we, we've got our own medal table of our research group uh, in London. We did very well. We think we contributed to 24 medals. Uh, for 15 sports and we had an even better uh, Rio Olympics where we um, we supported uh, 42 medal successes so um, and now I'm just going to talk uh, a bit about a few of the sports that we work with and a few of the projects that we work on on the technical innovations uh, that we've created so this slide again I've tried to cover the whole the whole picture of a sport um, on the right hand side, I say it's all about the medals. We've got our three uh, Taekwondo athletes there with their gold and silver medals. On the left hand side, we've got a coach working with an athlete, very common occurrence in elite sport, looking at some training footage there, or some competition footage. But the image I just want to focus on uh, initially is in the bottom left hand corner. We've got a peak inside the uh, Taekwondo training facility there. Uh, with an image of two athletes uh, uh, sparring, training. And then I've just zoomed in. What One of the key areas of our work that we deliver on are bespoke, um, bespoke software tools. But as Nigel mentioned in the introduction, it's software, often a combination of a software hardware solution. So what we've got here and the... Um, You've got the, the man in the blue top is driving the system. We've got a capture system, simple touchscreen capture system, capturing the sparring, and they can simply watch the sparring at the end of their, of their session. But what we've also added in here is we've got two athletes. For those of you who don't know about Taekwondo, we've got two athletes here wearing scoring vests. So these are vests that detect certain hits and the strength and the, 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 the power of certain hits are uh, both on the head and the body and the feet. We're also wearing gloves. This data we could capture with the video to actually provide more insight for the analysts as to what is going on. And also a key element of the analyst's work is to tag the footage afterwards. So after a sparring out, they would look at where well, the head shots, the body shots to focus the athlete's attention during a debrief session. But what we managed to do is combine the two systems. So we are taking the data out of the scoring system, consuming that data, and then adding that in with the video system to then automatically, as soon as the bout was finished, the athletes or the coaches would come up to the touch screen and see these blue or red events where the athlete may have had a body shot or a, or a head shot. Just to get a really simple introduction to the kind of work we do and again a common theme throughout this presentation is how we're implementing what are quite simple technical innovations that have real major impact to the sport um, and then coming back to this uh coming back to this image on the top left hand side i mentioned we've got a coach working with a, a, an athlete um, in a debrief session so we, we've developed the software that Taekwondo use to capture pretty much everything about performance. Whether it's be results, weight, wellness, the training data, attendance, injuries, uh, tactics, debriefs, etc. And we bring all those into one, one central location to allow them to perform the detailed analysis on the data sets. I've highlighted a couple of uh, the metrics here. Weight, simple, you think, 
weigh, weigh the athletes in the morning, quite a simple uh, operation. Kind of partly due to COVID, but also as we're always looking at technical innovations. Um, we realised that on the market there are some high quality, relatively cheap weighing scales for, for, for um, measuring human weight that are smart, smart scales, the Wi-Fi enabled. So what we've managed to do is implement into the workflow where the athletes can simply stand on their scales on the morning. That data will be sent up into a central data system. So when the athlete actually arrives at training, the coach already knows what their weight is. And in combat sports, this is a real important metric to be, um, to be monitored. Wellness has been something similar. Um, on the previous slide, that's where I just popped back, we've got an athlete there using, a, using an app. We developed numerous apps for elite sport. Uh, it's worth pointing out there, there were probably 100 wellness apps on the App Store is, um, on, and on the Google Play Store, but the sports often want specific questions being asked in a specific format, and that's where we come in. We can listen to the coaches, listen to the end users, and develop that app it's specifically what they want. And one of the key benefits around creating these kind of technologies is the near 100% compliance in the usage of these technologies, because what you've actually uh, achieved there is a design of a, uh, an app in this case that has been created by the end user and one thing that we found is a way of maximizing engagement with the system is basically to allow the end user to create that system. So we've talked about there the wellness, training, attendance, injuries. These are all things that we need to capture and uh, pull into our central data system. I often get asked, this is, this is again related to Taekwondo, um, I've been asked what kind of difference, what kind of um, new innovations have you deployed uh, during the during the pandemic, during during lockdown? We've talked about the flow in terms of weighing the athletes before they, they come on site. Um, one key element is, of course, is 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 um, looking after the athletes in terms of screening the athletes for any potential COVID symptoms. So the obvious solution here was to provide some kind of building access system. Seen them in lots of other buildings, temperature monitoring, simple screening questionnaire on symptoms. But what we can also do is we can build this in with our existing system and actually ask them some wellness questions as well at the same time. Again, bringing all this data together so when it's needed in terms of the analysts, they have uh, access to all that data. Also, I'm not kind of saying whether we do this or not, because there's a certain element of confidentiality here, but by monitoring athletes daily and knowing who the athlete is, identifying the athletes, then got a really powerful data set. And rather than looking for, say, an athlete to exceed, or an athlete or a visitor or a member of staff to exceed a certain threshold on temperature, as an indicator of potential COVID or other infection, you can actually provide a, a calculate a baseline for each individual and then actually look at fluctuations to that baseline so it's not always about an absolute value that is exceeding the threshold it may actually be a user-centric threshold that they would that you would need to look out for um, and there's a couple of the athletes uh, using the system so we talked a lot about taekwondo we're going to move on now uh, this last slide i often drop in because um in terms of the support staff in elite sport, people often know about the analysts, nutritionists, S&T coaches. I consider my team as part of this wider athlete support team. We're another one of these uh, practitioners providing support to the athletes. Um, a lot of the things we've done for, for Taekwondo, we've also done for boxing. Dropping here, we've again designed uh, bespoke software for them, um, used by the elite team, the Olympic team, but also Anthony Joshua current world champion um, and then again pulling it back to the medals what it's all about we've got on the left hand side joe joyce and the right hand side just showing it's about the medals but it's also about having some fun while you're working so uh, you've got to get that balance you've got to get that balance um, moving on to another example now uh swimming swimming so on the left hand side we've got uh, one of the analysts one of the british swimming analysts and um, main reason for showing this slide for any of you who are um 
keen sports enthusiasts and watch uh, what say swimming on the TV at the Olympics. When you see a Team GB analyst up in the stands using their laptop, there is a very high probability that the software they are using has come from my team because we develop these bespoke software analysis tools for the majority of, of our Olympic teams. And then on the right hand side, in fact, should just on the left hand side, we can see a couple of camcorders. On the right hand side, I wanted to just give a really simple demonstration of the kind of uses of engineering principles and, um, and basic analysis tools. So if you're a young engineer wanting to solve a particular problem for um, a British swimming performance analyst, he may be given this, this scenario. On the right hand side, we've got our athletes ready to dive in, dive in at the start. This image here has just come from a camcorder. It's not calibrated in any way. We've not been able to calibrate the footage. However, we have got some known, known objects in the image. We've got these, we call them lane markers or lane ropes, and each, each plastic object is a certain size. It's about two or 300 mil. And when the, when the swimmer dives in, you can see my mouse, they'll land somewhere around here. And the analyst wants to know where they've landed and, and further down the, the pool where they've then broke out. So as a challenge in terms of solving this problem for the analysts, what we quickly realised was if you were to look, I'll try to explain this as clear as possible. If you were to look along a lane rope in a certain line and then looked at the colour and the colour changes along that trajectory, you'd actually see a nice sinusoidal wave because there's fluctuations in the colour. And it actually doesn't matter which colour channel you look at, you could look at any of the colour channels. And then using simple fast through transforms or just looking at peaks and troughs, you can easily, quickly, automatically, and in real time, provide the distance along that rope for where the swimmer has dived in and instantly give a metric measure back to the athletes and to the and to the coaches. So again, just a simple, a simple use of technology or engineering principles to solve a real world problem. A lot, this is another British swimming example. Um, down in Bath, the uh, one of the intensive training centers for British swimming, they have a camera system that we've designed for them. Now, a lot of our innovative technological solutions often just employ cameras used appropriately. Um, so in this case, we've got a number of cameras along the side of the pool. We've actually got a little portal here. I don't know if you can see it. We've got another camera looking at the front on view and then a number of cameras down the pool looking down onto the swimmer. Now, in terms of how are these valuable, well, these can give real time quality feedback to the coaches with footage that the coach simply can't see using their own eyes. So they can be able to advise on technique or possible interventions that they wish the swimmer to try and then evaluate whether the swimmer has actually taken this advice on board and then how effective that intervention is using simple timing because we can put reference lines on the, on the camera images to provide quick feedback. Now that was a very, very simple example of a, of a qualitative system. Um, what we've now got on screen is a system that they've got up in Loughborough, another British swimming facility. And I'll just talk you through this one. Um, if anyone's interested, actually, we're, we're talking about it here. But in terms of her, hearing from the horse's mouth, Adam Peaty, the, the, world, the current world uh, breaststroke champion, um, has actually done a video on YouTube. It's a really interesting video talking about the uh, $500,000 uh, performance analysis system that he uses and how it improves his start performance. So if we just sort of talk through it, on the left hand side, we've got a force platform. It's actually an instrumented start block, but the force platform is very similar to the kind of platform we'd see in a biomechanics lab on the, on the, on the floor to measure, for example, say gait analysis. And then we've got our camera, we've got our sagittal view camera above water and below water. And then I've just shown here um, a couple of uh, force traces. Now, what a system like this allows an analyst to do and the coach, the coach may have a particular intervention they want to try, okay? 
Because you may think, well, as soon as that gun goes, you've got to go. Yeah, that would be the intuitive advice for any swimmer. However, when you think about it, maybe as soon as a swimmer hears the gun, they should recoil slightly and then explode off the blocks. And what we can do with a system such as this is we can measure, well, first of all, what the intervention was, so what was the swimmer being asked to do, then provide every aspect of detail in terms of then what did happen, so all the forces on the block, the angle, so the force vector, you can see that yellow line here, and then the overall outcome, which could be something like time to five meters or time to 15 meters, as Adam quotes in the video. And then all of this is provided um, as a simple feedback tool using some software that we've developed that runs poolside. So literally, and it's quite a grainy image, but as soon as Adam or any other swimmer jumps out the pool, they've got all that information at the fingertips or the coach, has, should, should I say. And there are many studies showing that the most, by far the most effective feedback mechanism is real-time feedback for the athlete to be able to understand the results, understand the analysis, and actually to provide a effective use of this 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 analysis and this this uh, this this coaching, that information has to be provided in real time. And that's a really important aspect of our work. Um, so just moving on to a slightly different topic now, which I, I won't I won't dwell on for too long, but it's a really important feature of our work for me. I mentioned about the um, the compliance and using a system, you know, actually getting athletes to say use a wellness system. We use a principle that I'm sure many of you heard of in terms of co-design, where we, in the simple three steps, we de define a problem, develop a solution, and then deliver it. Quite industry standard um, uh, structure. So what does this mean in terms of our systems? Well, we co-design the systems with a coach. We we listen to what they want. We try and understand what the question is. Now this might be a research question or it might be a performance question, depending on the nature of the project. We translate what they want into what we can actually then deliver. And we feel that what they actually are asking for, even if it isn't maybe what they first um, came to us with. We build a prototype quickly. This for me is almost analogous to any kind of product design life cycle really important that we get a prototype out there that then the coaches and lists uh, end user can, can can work with they test it they give us feedback and we improve it and then we test again and the cycle almost con continues um, and in presentations i've given to undergraduates postgraduates who work in our area first important lesson of listening listening what are people what are people saying they want and then deliver what they want in the format that they want to whatever that platform may be whatever that technology may be that's appropriate for their particular solution that's what we deliver so back to back to sports um and so this this is a really simple example um really of what i was talking about a moment ago in the previous slide the coaches at british gymnastics could come to us saying we effectively want to re a simple replay system a replay system for using a high-speed video camera for the vault and dead simple we want as soon as the athlete has uh, performed the vault we don't want to have to touch anything we don't want to have to trigger uh, a capture button or a, or a trigger button so what we've got here and if as the athlete comes across here we've basically got an optical trigger around where the mouse is and as soon as there's any motion there our algorithms can pick up that motion trigger the camera system and then replay the video first of all in full speed half speed quarter speed on a tv screen in the gym again providing that instant feedback that real-time feedback to the athletes and another example of how a really simple image processing algorithm can be used very effectively in a in a solution for um elite sport training that was a, a simple example of how computer vision or image processing algorithms can be used. In this example, we've got our Thor system. This is for um, hammer analysis. So we'll see in, in a moment um, uh, how this system is used. 
we've got two cameras on either side and we calibrate these cameras using what's called the checkerboard method so on the left hand side we can see the checkerboard now, this is a technology we've used for about 50 oh I should say not technology um a method of camera calibration that we've used for about 15 years now the major advantage of this method of calibration is you can do it in the field and effectively you can capture images of a checkerboard at lots of different orientations and positions in front of the two cameras and then using a global optimization technique you can optimize or solve for the camera model for both the intrinsic camera models so that's for each individual camera with like focal length principal points radial distortions we can solve for all those and then also reconstruct the extrinsic parameters of the cameras it's going to have the two cameras it's really just one camera relevant uh, relative to the other and what that allows us to do is analysis such as this we've got the hammer thrower indoors behind the net which is very very important with the cameras at this side of the net and again what this can allow us to do is this system can track the hammer automatically using uh, our image processing algorithms now i must admit it's probably actually quite hard even seeing the hammer but trust me it's just behind the net here and what we can do here we can automatically extract the image of that hammer reconstruct sorry in two in two cameras reconstruct that into 3d and provide charts such as those shown on the right hand side such as the hammer velocity or the radius of the rotation it's kind of like the instantaneous radius at any point because it's constantly changing and then also looking at the plane angle so that's actually the overall rotation plane angle and again where this is used is that real-time feedback so the athlete may have been instructed to do a certain intervention so to delay a certain point of their um, of their technique or of the a delay a certain phase of the build-up in the hammer and then we can instantly provide feedback on say the velocity or any of these other metrics and one thing to add here this is indoors but just to prove the or to, to illustrate the power of these algorithms we can actually conduct this analysis outdoors now you might wonder well what's the difference indoors outdoors what's the difference outdoors the net moves ever so slightly due to the wind but what our other algorithms can do is extract this small amount of movement with a background subtraction to then still leave the ability to capture the spherical object being the, the hammer in the analysis um one quick slide on the work we're doing with british cycling so we've got this this crank cam project apologies for the fuzzy image um what what we've got in the uh, two images at the top are a cyclist in the gym the cyclist is on a bike ergo quite a standard bike ergo on the ergo again it's quite standard torque sensing cranks and force sensing pedals quite industry standard and this can give you then the the forces of the, of the torques output by the athletes at the crank but what we've been able to do using inverse dynamics methods that we've generated here at Sheffield Holland University we can actually calculate or estimate where those forces and torques have been generated in the body so we can actually look at where the, what the magnitude of the torque or the moment is at the knee or the forces are in certain points and then how these algorithms can be used or how this analysis system can be used when the athlete is being asked to try different body shapes because we'll come on to aerodynamics in one moment they may be asked to adopt a certain body shape to gain an aerodynamic advantage what we can look at is what is the the effect of the penalty or the potential penalty in terms of forces and torque generation and then again common theme we wrap this up in a bespoke software package so I mentioned the aerodynamics um, classic image for us generated quite a number of years ago now um, 
lots of uh, horrible phrase to use, but lots of engineering going along here. Uh, we've got the design of the helmet, an aerodynamic helmet. We've scanned the helmet uh, and, the, and the body and the human body shape using our scanning equipment. We've then imported that into our computational fluid dynamics package, looking at the airflow, looking at the drag coefficient for this particular um, pose, for this particular uh, body shape. What we can then do is then give estimates about, well, when they're in a sprint and they've got their head down, what are the unintended consequences of a design such as this in terms of, in this case, the helmet design? And what this is an example, this is just one particular sport. We've done this in a number of sports and a number of projects, showing how we, have, we can uh, apply a complete workflow from scanning the real athletes. All athlete body shapes are different. We can scan the specific geometry of the equipment. There's some variability in um, the, the shape, the size, the profile of bespoke hardware being built. And we can then, through importing into our uh, computational fluid and our computer simulation packages, give information back to the athletes, back to the analysts uh, on the performance of the, of the equipment. Mentioned scanning in the last uh, couple of slides. Um, we do a lot of work here at Sheffield Hallam on advanced human body measurements and human morphology, looking at different body shapes. We have our gold standard, uh, 3DMD, uh, uh, 3D, capture, 3D camera system, which can create 3D models of what well, we've got a torso uh, in the shot here. Um, this is a very expensive system, gold standard system. What we've also done, and I touched upon this in our first slide, um, we've developed a scanning system using low cost, off the shelf consumer hardware. These are these uh, uh, Microsoft Connect 3D cameras. Whilst nobody's claiming that they have the same accuracy resolution as the gold standard system, through our adaptations of our algorithms that can reconstruct a 3D object from the scan data, so in this case from four cameras, we can validate our systems against the gold standard and show what accuracy we can achieve and then look at implementations or um, applications for these particular cameras. And again, this one we're, we're looking at a torso. In the sporting context, the sporting world, we've done a lot of work looking at lower body, lower leg, and also thigh volumes. Sometimes looking at, say, a strength and conditioning intervention, measure the thigh volume of maybe a cyclist, and then after a certain six week, 12 week intervention, a strength and conditioning intervention, we will measure again those volumes and look at the effectiveness of that particular intervention. Um, I've not I've uh, labelled these slides health related research. Um, whilst I'm not going to a massive amount of detail here, I'd just like to illustrate that the kind of technologies, methodologies that we've developed for sporting sports performance analysis, we're now using in our health and um, our health and well-being um, research. Specifically, this one example, we're looking at how. The, the scanning system can be used to measure the repeatability of breast orientation. So there's a, um, a support for all bra that part of the university uh, have been developing. And what we've been showing is using the scanning, how well is then the breast positioned or how repeatedly is the breast positioned for radiotherapy treatment in breast cancer. So that's an example of the kind of research we do in the sporting context being used in other in other areas um, one other area uh, to cover um, uh, a new area for us although um, obviously machine learning has been around for a number of years um, we use machine learning techniques uh, in say football football analysis this particular project looking at player ball tracking uh, an important element of this is the pose extraction, so extracting the, the pose of the player 
In this case, it's specifically looking at event recognition. So looking at certain actions and extracting them automatically out of the, out of the images. This particular study is looking at how you can collect large data sets that have been generated automatically, like I say, in a football context. Bringing it back to our elite sport world and our, and our Olympic athletes, um, got this image here showing some of our uh, initial work adopting machine learning techniques, algorithms into uh, Taekwondo. So what's going on here, we can extract the two athletes from tournament footage. We can then extrapolate the, uh, the virtual center of mass, so the projected center of mass of the athletes onto the, um, onto the mat. This can be used for analysis such as where, where the, are the athletes uh, dominating the ring, what techniques are the uh, athletes adopting in their fighting. Now, this is very useful for say, analyzing our own athletes, our home athletes, but what machine learning and automated uh, analysis allows us to do is to gather large, amount, large data sets for our opponents and achieve analysis, which we simply haven't been able to do in the past, but mainly due to the amount of time it would take to analyze these images in uh, the kind of depth that's required to actually provide useful information for the analysts. And once we've extracted the bounding box that we call it here, we can also then implement our pose extraction algorithms and overlay a pose onto the athletes at each time frame. And then again, as in the previous slide, by looking at the poses and by training our models on these, on these, on these sequences of images and tagging it with known events, so essentially training, training the uh, algorithms, um, we can extract the events, such as an attempted, an attempted head kick or a um, attempted body shot. And these attempted shots wouldn't normally be picked up by the scoring system. However, it's valuable information for the analysts. And it's a great example of how techniques such as, in this case, machine learning, but we also use uh, certain computer vision techniques can be used to enhance the, the analysis of our um, of the, of the athletes uh, in, in tournament footage. One other example, um, not sure how well this video is gonna play, but um, all linked together in terms of, again, another pose extraction um, of our runner, one of our colleagues here, Ben. Um, this work was covered in a recent BBC programme, Getting Fit at Home. Um, in terms of this work, it's, it's acknowledged that this kind of analysis isn't the same as providing um, highly accurate motion analysis that you would conduct in a laboratory using something like a, a very expensive mocap system. However, it can provide really useful information in the field, maybe looking, this is a sagittal view, but say from front on, looking at the trunk, looking at the upper body. And if a physio has advised a certain athlete to try and minimize that, oscillation or that variability in that uh, upper body position techniques like this can easily be adopted to actually give those that instant feedback and give systematic differences and looking at the effectiveness of certain interventions and then uh, this is actually the last this is actually the last slide we've talked a lot about the data systems that we've um, developed for the sport one key area that I've not touched upon too much is use of standard consumer hardware and how it can be used to benefit our elite sport athletes, our elite athletes. So we've got a few images here. You know, on the right hand side, we've got one of these uh, activity rings. I'm actually wearing one here. Lots of people will be familiar with uh, activity bands, but these rings, these can measure heart rate variability, skin temperature. And all the time we're looking at how simple, low cost consumer hardware can be used to benefit uh, our Team GB sporting performance. On the bottom left hand side, heart rate monitor, standard heart rate monitor. These are often used by athletes in training and that data is sent to their own portal 
and actually very hard to extract that data easily. So say they've done a, a training session and the analysts want access to all that data from all the analysts' uh, polar heart rate monitors, rebuild systems that allow them to consume that data from all the different athletes back into our central data management system. And then the image in the, the centre is a heart rate variability monitor. We're looking at how so new metrics or metrics which haven't been used often in the past, such as heart rate variability, can be used to monitor the fatigue of an athlete or their readiness to train. All of this work is about trying to inform the analyst, the coach, the medics, you know, the physio or the doctors about the athlete's current health. And again, all of this data can be collected actually before the athlete arrives at the training centre. So as soon as the athlete walks into that building, the medical staff, the nutritionists, etc., know all that information they need to know about the athlete's current health in terms of how they overtrained the previous day and use that information to guide the training program for that particular day. Okay, and on that, I'd like to thank you for listening and um, I believe we open the floor for questioning. So back over to you, Nigel. Thank you very much, Simon. I'll just stop sharing. There we go. <clears throat> and hopefully that was about the time that or the duration that we intended. That, that was wonderful. Thank, thank you very much for that. And um, speaking of sport, I, I would like to thank you for being a, a jolly good sport because uh, I, I completely uh, relocated you in the wrong part oh, okay. of the city. It's all right. It's my introduction. <laughs> so, uh, I managed to get plenty of um, mentions of Sheffield Hallam University. And yes, so indeed, okay. it is it's Sheffield Hallam University, not That's Sheffield. Right. So I, I transported you... Uh, uh, okay. a, a little way um, <laughs> uh, oh. a little way further away from uh, from where you actually are and th sorry that's my lazy uh, putting of push pins in google earth really. but um in fact your uh, your activity is, is so new that if you look on google earth that you're just a brownfield site <laughs> that's right no that's absolutely right we've only been there a couple of years we were only actually uh, in the building for about three or four months uh, before the pandemic hit and um, we all had to work at home. So, so everything is, it still feels very, very new and... Um, Absolutely. You, you've still got the smell of new paint. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. When we get a chance to go in <laughs> to, to see the buildings here. Well, I, I think um, the work that you're doing is just amazing and, and uh, the, the combining of both um the the electronics and imaging um along with the the movement of people um is there any difference when you when you uh, study for example men versus women or able-bodied versus paralympic athletes is, is there any particular challenge that uh, is different um that's an interesting question um in terms of Male, say, versus female, you know, very little because the sports are, uh, sports are essentially the same. You know, there's, it's not nothing really gender specific. However, what I feel is important to sort of raise as a discussion topic, you know, is um, a story we were discussing just a couple of days ago, how in terms of the representation of males and females in sports, this, this Olympics for the first time, the number of women will outnumber the number of men oh, right. representing Team GB. Mm. Now, that was certainly in the original selection. Um, of course, we're still waiting on the final selection uh, this year. Um, and, you know, in terms of um, the other areas that say, oh, sorry, the specific areas that you may look at in terms of gender-specific areas, you know, there is there's real investment. It's a really important area in terms of female health and the menstrual cycle. So, no, first of all, in terms of any intervention in this area, the first thing you must do is have the data. So in our wellness apps, we'll, be, we'll, be, we'll have a question there that only appears for the female mm -hmm. athletes. Mm -hmm. And then around that, there's work done around the prevalence of injuries at certain points in the cycle. 
And as that data is there, there, that data can then be used by the, uh, by the coaches in terms of setting training programs based on different points in the, in the menstrual cycle. So there are there are differences there are there are differences between the between the genders, um, and also there's a real interesting study that we were also part of, uh, looking at performance in terms of female performance at different points in the cycle, and actually how, as the cycle uh, continued monthly, there was monthly fluctuations in performance as well. So, mm. certain specifics, and in terms of able-bodied and para, there are a number of different sports in para. There are, um, should we say, a number of opportunities in terms of equipment design, in terms of, say, wheelchair design that, that just aren't, um, aren't relevant in, say, able body sports because they are different sports. So I'd say in terms of equipment design, the main difference is there are actually far more opportunities in Paralympic sport to optimise the performance of equipment. So you... you in in um in for example uh, motor racing um you you find that every uh, car has a has a camera attached to it now um i i can't really envisage doing that for um for most of the equipment that um that the athletes in the summer olympics would uh, w- would be using and uh where where it's only their their own body then i can't uh, maybe you maybe you can envisage putting cameras and detectors um, on the, the the athlete or their the, their very personal equipment, but perhaps in para there's more opportunity. I don't, I don't know. Is that something that you can envisage think, happening? Potentially, I think that if if we sort of take a step back in terms of say you know TV coverage, talking about cameras, it's TV mm. coverage. You know, I think what all sports are very aware of, and sport generally, is that they need to make themselves attractive, you know, in terms of the TV audience. That's how these sports essentially become so successful. Mm. And just taking sort of one, one slight, 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 slight side step, I've talked about tennis and social tennis federation in terms of, you know, where, where I began. You know, they've been really aware and been really reactive and been able to allow technology to be introduced so, you know, there's always new materials used, new tennis racket designs, mm-hmm. without actually affecting the nature of the game. The game itself, they managed to preserve, which is so important, because that keeps the interest in the sport, allowing that technology to be introduced into the sport without affecting the nature of the game. Now, part of that was to buy myself a little bit of time in terms of how I think cameras could be used um, in terms of Olympic sports. I think, it, again, it comes back to that thing of ta- cameras will be used as appropriate to provide that TV experience that yeah they 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 they, they, they um, strive for in terms so you, of Olympic you think it's coverage. the TV that will lead rather than um, absolutely than the science absolutely in terms of the cameras being used say on the athletes if we then took another step side in terms of looking at what athletes may wear in say training you know one one area that really excites me is virtual reality. And if you look at, say, an athlete's performance when they're just, just a wrong phrase to use, but when they're, di- when they're, when they're training at Ponds Forge, so that's our uh, main swimming pool in Sheffield, the, 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 the divers may go up onto that 10-metre platform. It's, there's nobody around, perform that fantastic dive, but then put them in front of 20,000 people and the pressure mm. of the Olympics, and it's a totally different dive. Now, virtual reality offers a potential solution to that. So during training, they would wear some kind of virtual reality device. Now, in reality, my analogy that I often give here is where we are now with virtual reality and the huge headsets are almost like the 1980s with mobile phones. You had those huge mobile phones. Mm. I'm sure back then nobody expected that we'd have these tiny devices that were power, the power of a mainframe computer. But that's where we've got to in sort of 40 years and I really do envisage that we'll be having just simple glasses or goggles maybe that they could wear that they then will be able to provide that virtual reality experience but it would be for the training benefit and the, mm. the customization benefit uh, which I think is a really exciting area 
But then the last thing I'll say on it, in terms of the lockdown, I think there were loads of opportunities for virtual reality and they haven't materialised. And for me, that just clarifies where we are with that technology. We're still in the infancy, in my opinion, for virtual reality headsets. I don't know, maybe one day we'll have um, cameras in the tennis ball in, in the way that you, know, you have cameras in the stumps in cricket uh, to get the... Uh, the first person view it's, it sounds a bit ridiculous but um you know maybe not quite but i think if somebody if you said to ian both and back you know whatever about having cameras in the stumps he'd have probably thought that was ridiculous too and um things things it's incredible how technology does actually move when they've got that motivation um so yeah so i guess my my other question that uh, that was prompted by your um, your excellent uh, talk there was how do you get the athletes to actually take any notice of what you find? Um, it, you, you can see in your analysis um, that perhaps if they, in, in your example, pulled back a bit rather than dived straight yeah. away into the swimming pool, but how, how do you explain that and, and get them to take any notice of it? Really good question, really good question. Um, the easy answer for me is again to use the adam pt example so I, lo I loved watching that video it's on his youtube channel shouldn't probably advertise it as such but it was great to hear him he he gives the commentary throughout the video and it's him talking about how he achieved a certain time and then through different interventions it doesn't necessarily go into detail he then achieves this time so in terms of that motivation that you're talking about i think the athlete is just if we can give them that data, you know, provide them the real hard quantitative evidence that this particular intervention has led to a performance, I believe that's how that's the key in terms of the we call it the compliance, you know, that actually engaging with the athletes. Um, beyond beyond that, it's it's again relating to providing the evidence or providing and the mobile phone, and so we talk about technologies that have come in over the last so many years. Again, giving them access to this information, their own their own information, is another way of actually helping them to absorb absorb the instructions, mm -hmm. kind of in their own time. Because we talk a lot about real time feedback. Well, actually, if they then have just done a really hard effort, a boxer, you know, coming out of three sparring sessions. They need time to recover. If you try and feed them a particular message at that point, yeah, yeah. it yeah. may not be that effective. <laughs> Whereas so uh, some some of it is the timing of the messaging as well, not just not just what the actual message is. So there's a, there's a certain amount of diplomacy in the <laughs> yeah, and, well. and and a human uh, interaction as much as there is the technology. There is, there is, and when we're talking about so we're involving lots of different projects, one about how chatbots could be used. So in terms of if an athlete was to say a certain thing, what would a chatbot respond with if that chatbot was trained to be trained based on like the best coach? You know, could you have the best coach in the world train a chatbot to when an athlete says X, does this best coach in the world? deliver why mm. and that could be done technology is there to allow that that's actually quite a simple implementation but it would never be taken forward because all the athletes are unique and all the coaches are unique so absolutely it's down to that human interaction which you just can't replace yet with a chatbot well thankfully it is down to the humans in the end the the original olympic spirit yeah i'm going to bring in now um Samantha and Richard, because uh, we've got uh, questions coming from the audience. So let's keep the conversation going. And I think Samantha is going to kick us off with um, audience questions. If you have got any questions, please use the Zoom Q&A facility, the, the button down at the bottom of the screen. And uh, we're still monitoring those and we'll see if we have time to put them forward to Simon. So over to you, Samantha. Hello. Hi, Simon. Hi there, Samantha. Uh, we've got some really good questions so let's kick off with the first one um, and that is uh, what's the best engineering discipline that you should be studying to get into this field and can you relate it to your 
to what you studied at university and your career path to get to your current position? Right, sure. Great question. Great question. Um, in terms of, it's because it was which is the engineering discipline. When we've 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 I've given lots of presentations to um, uh, secondary school children and um, A level students, and the I'm trying to I'm always shoehorning an answer here. Whenever they ask about you know what area, we always say do maths and physics, do maths and physics, whatever. Whatever you end up then doing, say at university and in terms of uh, certain courses, maths and physics is just fundamental in all aspects of our work. It can lead then to, if you were to do mechanical engineering, like myself, you have then that fundamental understanding of systems. So in terms of if we're looking at improving the performance of a system or being able to apply, you know, I, I went through the examples quite quickly, but if we went back to the swimming example with the instrumented start block, actually making that work had some huge mechanical engineering challenges. Never mind the atmosphere being one of them. That was one of the first challenges. And also force plates are always on the ground. There's, there's zero compliance. It's infinitely stiff. It's attached to a concrete mount. Then imagine trying to place this device, which should be rigidly mount, mounted, sorry, and it needs to be 300 mil off the pool surface. You're on a swimming pool surface, tilted as well. There are lo there's so many engineering challenges. So for challenges such as that, mechanical engineering. We then move to um, other areas of our work, looking at wearable sensors in those particular areas. Electronic engineering would be would be the obvious um, the route into that that area of work. And in my area, I mean, I'm mechanical engineering by background, but I've also um, had training in uh, software development. So then I can bring the two parts together and create these combined software hardware um, solutions for elite sports. Yeah. Um, it's, it sort of sounds like you you're saying that you need to be able to span more than one discipline to really make your, your mark in, uh, and that may be true for engineering in general these days. And um, as a plug for the IET, it's one of the things that we're very keen on. So, uh, yeah. And it certainly opens up opportunities for you, doesn't it? By having the, you know, a number of different disciplines as well. It does. And something which they, they taught me at the University of Sheffield, teamwork as well. You know, we, that's why it's such, an it's such an interesting question. And it was the exact reason I showed the picture of the team to show how we've got so many different backgrounds mm. that allow us to then deliver the projects that we deliver on. If we were just 18 mechanical engineers, whilst we would have a very strong uh, uh, skill set in that area, we couldn't deliver the projects that I've been talking about this evening. Can you just explain a little bit about your career path? So having studied mechanical engineering, how did, what was the career path to get you to your current position? Sure, sure. Um, uh, and if I just took one step back as well, I grew up on a farm, I was always interested in improving the performance of a baler, you know, a straw baler, how can we make it bale straw faster? Uh, then I came to uh, University of Sheffield to do a mechanical engineering degree. I actually did, then did a Master's of Research in MRES. Um, I did that with JCB, working on the design of the rear of a tractor, the rear linkage. Um, but then whilst that was uh, joining two of my interests in terms of mechanical engineering and farming, the opportunity to work within my other passion of, of sports came along and sports engineering again, was that combination of my two passions. My PhD was very uh, academic. It was modeling an impact between a tennis ball and a tennis racket, which to be honest, involved a lot of finite element analysis. That's how we, we um, that was the technique we used to analyze the impact. But one thing I learned, and this was back in about 2002, is you can do all this academic research, but in the field of elite sports, you have to be able to disseminate your research. And to do that, I developed a, um, a software package called Tennis Gut, 
it was Steve's idea, Grand Un Yeah, if you all know Steve, you know the story behind the Grand Unified Theory. Steve with his physics background. Um, so we developed Tennis Gut. And what that allowed the end user, which was the International Tennis Federation and the wider tennis community, they could use my research in a software package. They could change the size of a tennis ball, the stiffness of a tennis ball. And what did it do? It had a little slider that made the ball bigger and smaller. To them, it was almost like a computer game. But we actually created, a, um, I, I was called it hand-coded finite element model behind that was then solving these new scenarios. So if you stiffened up the tennis racket by 20%. So that's how I got involved in software development. I realized then just even back in early 2000, there was this huge need for um, joining hardware systems with bespoke software. So we don't, we don't really develop hardware, we take off the shelf cameras, but it's how we take that image data using our computer vision algorithms to provide that end solution in a bespoke software package. Thank you. Richard, uh, have you got a question to jump in with? Yeah, great. So, uh, excellent talk. Uh, thank you very much, Simon. Um, we've we've got a, a load of questions here, uh, which I'm going to merge a couple together. Um, one of which is, um, where does the SERG get its funding from, um, and how do you choose uh, the sports you work with? You, you said there's 26 Olympic sports. You're not working with all of them yet. Yeah. Um, so, uh, major funder it tends to trace back to UK sport. So UK Sport, Lottery funded, and also through the Exchequer. Um, they fund us then through the English Institute of Sport, but also the Scottish Institute of Sport as well. So they're kind of like the umbrella funding. And then these are still large organisations, and specifically the two departments we work with. One is Performance Innovation, which is just like the dream name of a department for someone like us to work with around innovations in performance. And then also we work with sports intelligence. So there are the other um, major partners for us. So that's looking at advanced data analytics, et cetera, and the kind of machine learning that we were talking about. And then it's, it's working closely with the sports themselves and building up that reputation. The sports, we've talked there about EIS and you know, the, the, the overall funding, but sports themselves will have specific projects they want us to work on. So we, we, um, we engage directly with them. And that's for the work we've been talking about, but we work really closely with FIFA, so the mm -hmm. governing body of football, the International Tennis Federation. And what we're working with, I'd say more and more, but we've always worked a lot with them, are sports equipment manufacturers. They're a huge, that's a huge area of our work that, you know, it would be a, would be a presentation in itself. We have patents with golf club manufacturers where we've designed different heads to drivers. And I'm sure people are all aware of the mechanics involved there, but that's actually to do with the aerodynamics and how you'd actually design a different golf driver head to minimise drag. So... Okay. And you mentioned uh, your your colleague Steve Hake, who uh, was very kind to uh, to come and talk to us um, a few months ago. Um, I think you can find that video on uh, on our YouTube channel now, and, and and he talks about some of the equipment that you've designed. So very much your, what you're you've been talking about today is uh, is taking that story forward and, and making it uh, relevant to what's coming up in the next few weeks. Hopefully, absolutely. Absolutely, we hope. <laughs> Good stuff, thank you. Okay, next question, Simon. Um, obviously, your work, your research work, generates a lot of data. So how do you determine what's the necessary data that you need? Um, and also, the results from your research projects, are they available on the public domain? Um, I'll answer probably just in reverse. In terms of uh, the public domain, there's, even in these presentations, there's a certain degree of competitive advantage that the sports who are funding us and the EIS, so English Institute of Sport, they won't allow us to reveal cert certain aspects mm -hmm. as with any kind of contract research. 
That said, our um, camera calibration techniques are publicised. We have a couple of websites, Check2D and Check3D.co.uk, where we've taken what are essentially industry standard camera calibration techniques. We call it checkerboard, other people call it planar calibration. Now, that as a technique is quite easy to use. However, what we did, we packaged it up into a toolbox that anyone can download and use. Because really, for the majority of end users, they don't want to understand how to run the optimization technique to calculate intrinsic and extrinsic parameters. And we're happy to, to, to publish that and to share to share our toolboxes because the real value for us, to be honest, and the real challenges are around, yeah, taking those algorithms but making them work underwater to analyze a swimmer. And um, now we are hoping to, to publish um, soon on some work we've done with British swimming. It'll be after the Olympics and probably only a snapshot of um, the actual work we've done. But, um, and then just remembering back to the first question in terms of the amount of data, the type of data and how we select uh, which, which metrics to use. Um, the thing about that one is it's, it's very much on a case by case basis. Um, in terms of our kind of general philosophy is we don't capture data unless we're going to use it. So that's, that's the first one. We only, we only capture the metrics that then we're going to use. So for combat sports, wellness, weight, injuries are all really important and get used. So in terms of then the wider, you know, capturing data and how we decide, I'll be honest, it's, it's, it's kind of the answer to the previous one that we, we only capture what we need. Um, certainly in this, in this area of work, if we say touched on Steve's work, so Steve is director of the uh, Parkrun Research Board. So Parkrun, I'm sure lots of people are familiar, it's a, a weekly time run on a Saturday morning. They have huge amounts of data because Steve has access to all that data for all the participants. There, in terms of choosing what data to analyze, it all comes back to what's the research question? What is that question you're actually trying to answer? And then you pick relevant data sets and the data metrics. I'm interested in in, um, in swimming and you, you mentioned the the pool in Loughborough. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which I, I've had the great privilege of swimming in actually. Right. Yes. And, and I, I know that they've got um, right along the length of the pool, they've got um, uh, windows so you, you can stand in an underground room and, and watch the, um, the swimmers as they're uh, something right along the length of the pool is it is it is it something that you would you would image capture the entire length of a swim or is it just really the start that's important um, it's it's the entire length of the pool it's the entire length of the pool the the coaches would well if we're doing a starts analysis there may be the metric there may be uh time to 15 meters that's all they're really interested in and then they want to look at the technique that then led to that particular time but when they're looking at, say, the swimmer doing full 50 meter lengths, even then we have to use creative solutions to provide the feedback they want. And what we basically provide is a static swimmer. OK, so in hindsight, I wish I'd show the image because it is really impressive. You have cameras literally recording them and there's about 10, 10 cameras all mm. along the pool. Yeah. And if we did nothing, you would have swimmer coming in. So we're going out, swimmer so coming in, so we're going yes, out. What we don't, we can automatically trap the swimmer. So they stay in the middle doing their motion. And then you can, so, so the swimmer's hip never moves. It stays static in the center of the image and the, the, the water moves past the camera. Now, again, whilst this was quite a, rel a relatively simple image processing um, task, so effective for the coaches because then you could overlay two swimmers or a swimmer from mm. say six months ago with their improved technique. And if it's a particular body shape that they're asking the swimmer to adopt, there is no better way of either qualitatively or quantitatively um, illustrating that than with what we call a static swimmer. So I wish I'd got an image to be able to show, but hopefully my, yeah, 
uh, narrative has um, been fairly clear. Oh, that's, that sounds fantastic. And Richard? Yes, um, we've got a question here from Malcolm. Uh, it says, sorry for the bias. Uh, he's uh, noticed that uh, just up the road from, from where you are is a ski centre. Obviously, this talk's focusing on the Summer Olympics, but uh, next year we'll have the Winter Olympics. Um, do you do any work with any of the Winter Olympic sports? We do, we do, we do. So um, we've not shown uh, our skeleton work, but it's so skeleton bob, um, where the, uh, the athlete goes down headfirst, down a toboggan run. We've done very similar work that I showed for British Cycling, but we're actually doing it for skeletons. We'd, we'd scan the athlete and then do our computer simulation using uh, computational fluid dynamics. Um, but then what's more um, uh, regular in terms of one of our systems being used, again, down in Bath, University of Bath, whilst we don't have much snow in this country and we don't have any toboggan runs, what we do have is a start track. So down in, some of you may have already seen it, they've got a, a narrow gauge model railway track. So the sort of uh, tracks about this wide, they put wheels on their skeleton bob and also their bobsleigh. And then we have a timing system that times them down the track, but it's also got a live velocity measurement on the sleds that then can feed back to the system as well. So not only can they measure time at two meters, five meters, 10 meters, et cetera, they can look at the acceleration. And, and a really key aspect for them to look at is as they're pushing the sled, so say they're pushing along with one hand, they've then got to mount onto it. And by looking at the instantaneous velocity over that particular time, they can look at optimizing the loading technique as well. Because actually, if you get the loading technique wrong, and I've tried it once myself, it is really difficult. <laughs> you can actually slow down massively. If you time it wrong, when you come to land on the sled, you'll slow down massively. And the final thing to say in terms of uh, Skeleton Bob, we're really successful. We are really successful. If you look at that sport, for a country with um, very minimal facilities, we win a lot of medals in that area. Great, thank wow. you. There, there, there is something. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you, you said uh, that you you had an interest in uh, in sports. So, if if you were going to watch a sport, which one would it be? Taekwondo. Oh, really? Anyway, okay. Yeah, love taekwondo. Okay. It's a sport that um, has quite a low profile, but it's the the, the technical aspect. Um, also, my involvement. Uh, a quick anecdote, there's been no better highlight in my career than when I was invited over to the World Championships. We were sat in the crowd, we'd been onto the mat, but we, because we had VIP tickets, me and my son, we were sat in the crowd, and I designed the scoring system for the World Championships, and what my system did, again, it was linked to what I was talking about, I was ethically extracting the data from the scoring system, from the vest, and then providing a graphic for the audience to see. Because it's such a fast sport, you actually don't notice if it was a headshot. You then see, oh, well, they scored. So what my graphic showed is a headshot to blue or a near miss. And there was a family sat behind me and said, oh, this is, this is great. Have you seen the scoring system? It's telling us what is happening. <laughs> and I'm sat there trying to say, do I turn around and say, yeah, I've developed that system. So, um, so yeah, just a personal anecdote there. Um, oh, wonderful. Yeah. Is, is, is that the, the kind of thing where you can imagine um, um, the, the equivalent of the, the football um, assisted referee where uh, um, <laughs> you, you could yeah. challenge whether, whether was it really a, a touch or not? Um, it, it is, it is. And it's a technology that has to work. Um, I'm trying to relate it to the football. Um, it's a system that is tested. Um, in terms of football, um, I think, as we mentioned, maybe in our uh, discussions before, it's almost like a whole new topic, a whole yes. topic to discuss uh, in a whole seminar in terms of uh, virtual offside line uh, work. Um, we are involved with FIFA with some of that work. Um, my comment is always when people criticise VAR, um, often VAR is just implementing the rule. 
the FIFA rule and where, where VAR gets criticism, sometimes uh, duly, um, often it's simply implementing the rule. And if that tiny bit body part of the, uh, of the forward is further ahead than that other body part of the defender, it is offside. <laughs> So, um, so yeah, yeah. But we might stay well, clear of that one. <laughs> I, I, I think, I think we should invite you back to tell us more about mm. that because um, that's certainly something that we've um, we've considered for uh, events um, in in our planning for uh, future things. Mm. Um, but for now, um, I, I think that's just about it for uh, audience questions. So, uh, thank you very much to. Uh, Richard and also to Samantha for uh, um, putting those forward on uh, on, on your behalf um, and really it just uh, uh, comes to me now to bring the event to a close and to give you a very hearty thank you Simon for um, a really fantastic tour I, I didn't think you'd manage to squeeze so many different sports into such a, a short amount of time um, and make it very relevant to engineering as well so uh, yes congratulations on that and thank you very much for uh, for sparing the time for us we much appreciate it thank you very much and thank you again for inviting me it's been a pleasure so I'll just um, close off uh, with a few uh, final remarks. Um, we often get questions about uh, CPD certificates uh, for uh, um, to recognise your attendance at these uh, events and you can obtain them now from our website. If you go to the iet.org forward slash Surrey you'll find our website and if you scroll down to the bottom you'll find the opportunity to download a certificate for uh, this evening's uh, lecture. You, you can also email our um, honorary secretary, uh, Peter Mansbridge, and he will also be able to provide you with the certificate as well. Um, and uh, next, really, to uh, point out what we're doing next month, four weeks today, our next event is uh, on the 16th of June, and we'll be hosting a talk by Sir John Samuel. And uh, for those of you that don't know him, uh, he is uh, very much an early pioneer in electric vehicles. And the um, event that we're going to be hearing, uh, the talk is going to be about Formula E. This is uh, electric cars racing. And the, uh, the point really is, it's uh, racing to change the face of the auto industry. Uh, Formula E is about uh, demonstrating the performance aspects of electric vehicles. And, and as we know, often what starts out in performance, whether it's um, in, uh, in the field of uh, sports or in the, uh, the field of motor racing, eventually filters down into things that uh, everyday people will be using. And uh, Sir John Samuel was uh, one of the early pioneers, uh, as, as I mentioned, and he's um, built and raced GT cars in the 1960s and developed the first uh, UK electric passenger vehicle called the Enfield 8000, I believe it's in 1970. And, and then he went off to, um, to the US, to D Detroit, to uh, try and convince them that electric vehicles were the thing back in the 1970s. And yet here we are now in, in the 2020s. Um, and he's got a very fascinating story around that and the, the very latest developments in Formula E and the battery technology, how they will be important in the, uh, the race to getting to uh, carbon neutral status for not only the UK but the world in the future so that's four weeks today on the 16th of June and that's about it so thank you very much for joining us today thank you again to Simon to Richard Samantha and uh, in the background um, Colin Cunningham has been uh, instrumental in producing this whole event and with that I'd like to thank you very much and wish you a good rest of the day <laughs>